John. Glory to Christ. Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came they were astonished that he was speaking to a woman, but no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say four months more, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from this city believed in him because of that woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, 
For we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. For the sermon, I want us to welcome Dr. Beth Sarah Wright. Dr. Wright is a native of Atlanta and is the founder of Thrive with Dignity, a work that helps us connect uh, some organizational ideas with that baptismal promise that we are to respect the dignity of every human being to help us and individually and as a group flourish in this particular mission. She has degrees from, uh, from Princeton and Cambridge and is the mother of five children. She was born into this, baptized into this tradition in the church in Jamaica, raised five children in this tradition, and her husband is currently the Bishop of Atlanta. At coffee hour afterwards, you can ask her whether she's happy to be staying in Atlanta or moving to New York, uh, instead of moving, moving to New York. Um, I'd like for us to give Dr. Wright a warm Good Shepherd welcome as she makes her way to the pulpit. What a joy it is to be with you this morning. Many thanks to Father Mills for this gracious invitation to be with you, the community of Good Shepherd Episcopal Church. Thank you, Morgan May, for your gracious invitation as well to be here. I bring you greetings from your siblings in Christ in the Episcopal Diocese of Atlanta. That is 120 worshiping communities in 75 and a half counties in middle and north Georgia, 56,000 men, women, teenagers, children, and as my husband, my husband, Bishop Robert Wright, fondly says, feisty seniors. As my mother is one of those feisty seniors, of course, I have the utmost respect. I understand that today is your blessing of the backpacks, and I love this time of year, don't you? And so many shiny new tools to prepare our children for a successful year ahead. I might be dating myself when I say I loved a brand new trapper keeper. Anybody remember those? I love that. It is such an exciting and hopeful time as school reopens. Truth be told, for some of the parents in the house, there is some relief on the part of us and it is fun, but nonetheless, it is fundamentally a time of great possibilities new goals, renewed energy, and renewed enthusiasm. Actually, this is the first time in my family, since we had our five children, since they were school age, that we don't have anyone going back to school or college. And I will miss that. But nonetheless, it is still a time of starting again. Renewed, all of us heading back to work, preparing for the new demands of life. So this morning, as we bless those backpacks with all their new trinkets to prepare our children for success, I'd like to ask you as a community, as followers of Christ, what resources do you have in your spiritual backpacks to prepare you to face and thrive in the vicissitudes of life? The readings this morning, thank you so much, so beautifully read, thank you, give us some tremendous resources. Did you see them? Right here in these readings, we have all the necessary tools we need to equip ourselves to live more authentically into who we say we are as Christians. Let's take a look. James, Jesus' brother, begins by giving us instruction, instructions for living a wise life, a life aligned with God. He says, quote, you can develop a healthy, robust community that lives right with God and enjoy its result only if you do the hard work of getting along with each other treating each other with dignity and honor. Powerful, powerful words. 
Isn't that what we all want? A healthy and robust community that lives right with God? When we look at our nation and indeed the world right now, with its deep divisiveness and partisanship and hate and war, we seem to be living in a way that is not aligned with God, that is not robust and healthy. With the increase in mental health challenges, rates of anxiety and depression among our youth and adults, we also don't seem to be enjoying, rejoicing the results of this way of living and being in community with each other. So how are we supposed to create this God-aligned community? I'm so glad you asked, thank you. We are to do the hard work of getting along with each other, treating each other with dignity. It is no coincidence that James refers to hard work of getting along with each other. If it were easy, the word would look a very different place. We wouldn't need these conversations. This is not easy work, but it is necessary work if we are to live a holy life. What does it mean to treat others with dignity? So dignity is the breath of God inside each of us. It is the divine etched into our DNA. It is unearned, unwavering, and immovable. It is our inherent worth. We all as human beings have dignity, regardless of where we've come from, what our portfolio says, what school we went to, what language we speak, what our GPA is, or even our behavior. We all have dignity. According to author Jeffrey Moses, he is the author of Oneness, the scriptures of the world's religions are clear that only by becoming aware of the divine within every person can the basis of peace and harmony be established. The preamble to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights clearly states that, quote, the recognition of the inherent dignity of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. But closer to home, is our baptismal covenant. The church's way of partnering with God's invitation to act and be different in the world. God bless you. It is where we publicly proclaim our partnership with God to live differently. Even Jesus was called to the baptismal transformation. The baptismal covenant includes, all right, I'm gonna ask you, anybody remember how many questions are in the baptismal covenant? Going once, going twice, eight questions. They're not statements. They lead up to the culminating question, will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? Remember that question? And we have a choice to answer either we will with God's help or we won't. What is remarkable about this extraordinary question is that as we strive for justice and peace, it does not ask us to tolerate or work with or include every human being. It does not ask us to agree with, or be kind to, or be polite to, or even to love every human being. It asks us to respect 
their dignity. As the wife of a bishop, when I travel with my husband, nearly every Sunday I find myself renewing my baptismal covenant because that's what he does, right? So I've been looking at this in a way of just very intense focus, and I am a lover of words. And so I wondered, what does it really mean to respect another's dignity? So respect from the Latin root word specere, like spectacles, means to look at and re again. Respect literally means to look again at, to look at another human being and to be present to the many assumptions and pre preconceived notions or biases we may have, and we all have them because we're human, to pause and to look again, to see new possibilities and new understandings, to see our common humanity. It is a new way of seeing, and this, my friends, is the hard work to see differently. We often think of respecting another when someone has done something worthy of respect, as if it is earned. But that is not at the root of this word. According to the root, everyone, every single person is worthy of being respected. Everyone is worthy of the act of being looked at again, no prerequisites necessary. Even the psalmist asked God in Psalm 8, I look up at the moon and stars mounted in their settings. Then I look at myself and I wonder, why do you bother with us? Why take a second look our way? but God does each and every time. When I speak with children about dignity, about looking again at another's dignity, I ask them to imagine putting on God goggles, seeing the way God sees us. What would that be like? To see the dignity in every human being is to see beyond that which we believe is real, which are only figments of our manipulated, maneuvered, and molded imaginations anyway, to see what is truly real, the divine potential embedded in our DNA. Dignity is this incredible thing inside of us, regardless of our outward manifestations, regardless of our stories, it knows we are made for more and has at its core the desire to be seen as fully human. But history has taught us that as we progress through life, that our inherent worth, that breath of God inside of us can be challenged, eroded, not seen, or even completely obliterated. But the good news is that it can also be affirmed, valued, and celebrated. We just need to choose to do that. We are just as vulnerable to feeling unworthy as we are to feeling worthy. And we all know the effects of both. Let us choose to take up this hard work of looking again at the dignity in others. Jesus, in his encounter with the Samaritan woman, I love that story, don't you? Teaches us how to look again at the dignity in others. Jesus knows exactly the situation that he has encountered as he sits down at the well. She is a woman when men and women rarely spoke in public. She's a Samaritan, where hatred between Jews and Samaritans was fierce and long-standing. She was a citizen of that area, where he was a transient passing through. Despite these differences, these obstacles, 
Jesus sees beyond to ask her for a drink of water. He then goes on to have the longest conversation he has with anyone in the Bible. That alone tells you how he honored her dignity and her presence. Jesus invites us to speak to one another, to talk and to listen. God may be instructive in designing our bodies with two ears and one mouth. The currency of dignity then becomes our stories. I tell you my story, you tell me your story, I see your dignity, you see my dignity. One of the most effective ways to peel back blindness is by telling and listening to our stories, sharing our life stories, listening to others and learning from others. Stories help us to see beyond. The novelist Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie says this, stories matter. Stories have been used to dispossess and to malign, but they can also be used to empower and to humanize. Stories can break the dignity of a people, but stories can also repair that broken dignity. In their conversation, Jesus reveals details of this woman's life story. Five husbands and now a man who is not her husband. No condemnation, no judgment. Unlike what was evident on his disciples' faces when they saw him speaking to her, they were astonished. When she asks how he, as a Jew, could possibly speak to her, he answers by pointing to God's generosity and gift and invites her to see a path to God's dream for us all. He says, the time has come where what you're called will not matter and where you go to worship will not matter. It's who you are and the way you live that count before God. Jesus himself is embodying the way of life that counts to God. He can see beyond their visible differences to see her dignity, what God sees in us all. Oh, but how easy it is to write someone off completely. Am I the only one in here? To not see or to acknowledge another's humanity, especially when they are different from us? or when they have brought us harm or sinned against us. But this is not our calling. This is not the way of living out our faith. Jesus calls us to something different. When you look at a caterpillar, do you see the butterfly? And when you look at a beautiful butterfly, do you also see the changes it has gone through to achieve that beauty? I am so glad God knows us intimately, all our blemishes, all our joys, all our missteps in our thoughts, words, and deeds, and yet chooses to see our dignity. So you might be thinking, how do we do this hard work? How do we actually change the way we see? I imagine that the Israelites were grappling with that question in the desert. They could not see a way forward. They could not see the dream God had for them. They quarreled, frustrating God's dream for them and even doubted God's presence. Is God even among us? They asked. But God eloquently answers their impossibility with radical possibility. Out of the hardness of rocks, God makes a waterfall possible. What do you do with God's dream for you? Do you let your fears and uncertainty blind you? Or do you live authentically, wholeheartedly into the dream God has set before you? Even when we doubt God's presence, God does not leave us or forsake us. 
God intercedes in our lives and prays for us with moans and groans when we do not have the words to pray. God, without being asked or asking for anything, showers us with grace and mercy and dignity and invites us to join God in that dream. So my husband and I just returned from Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Gorgeous. We were astounded by God's fingerprints visible in every direction. It was as if every picture I took was just incredible. From the Grand Tetons to magnificent moose and bison, it was spectacular. We went to Yellowstone National Park and visited Old Faithful. Remarkable. Do you know what Old Faithful is? It's a geyser, right? It is water erupting from rock. It isn't even the largest geyser, but it is the most reliable one. Old Faithful. And that is who God is. And that is what God does. This is what we rely on when we are faced with the impossible. God's faithfulness. Like water from rock, when we are blinded, God can open our eyes to see. Like water from rock, God can bring courage out of our fearful hearts. Bravery out of our cowardice. Like water from rock, God can bring forgiveness out of our vengeance, assurance out of our doubt, compassion out of our indifference. For with God, nothing is impossible. So fear not, you can see differently with God's help. As we send our children out into the world on this blessing of the Backpack Sunday, we remember that this and every Sunday, we are all God's children being sent out of this sanctuary with our spiritual backpacks, equipped to see with the eyes of our hearts, not just the eyes of our heads. For it is not what we look at that matters, but it is what we see. We are equipped with everything we need to take on the hard work of creating the community God has dreamed for us, one where we strive for justice, strive for justice and peace among all people, all people, and respect the dignity of every human being, one where we can live with joy, knowing we are authentically living into who we are called to be. This is our story. We are an Easter people after all. Let us rejoice knowing we can change this world one person at a time. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>